tracking on? Yeah. <laughs> uh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Princess Diana, once the most famous face in the world. But there was also private Diana, known only to a few. If you come in here, you sit down and be quiet. You've got to be very quiet. Very quiet. Don't touch it, William, because it's all focused on me. And this Diana had a story to tell. I was brought up in the sense that, you know, when you got engaged with someone, you loved them. In 1992, she began recording a series of videotapes. Grandpa, he leapt upon me, started mm. kissing me and everything. I thought, well, yeah, yeah, you know, this is what, what people do, and he's all over me. This was a different Diana, uninhibited, free-talking, candid. We met 13 times when we got married. <laughs> With a story that was rocking the foundations of the British monarchy. So I went to the top lady. And I'm sobbing and I said, what do I do? I'm coming to you, what do I do? And she said, I don't know what you should do. John take this. And that was it. That was help. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. There is no other footage that reveals her spirit so intimately. It has never been seen in Britain before. Diana knew there were few things more dangerous to the establishment than a princess with a story. You get into telling the story. No, I'm not. You're a storyteller. If you feel strong about a point, make it very strongly. You see how far you can go. This is BBC Radio in London. According to the French news agency, a French government minister has said within the past few minutes that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died. He said she was killed in a car crash in central Paris. I'll repeat that. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car crash in the centre of Paris. This is a story from a green and pleasant land about a prince and his princess. According to legend, it was the birthplace of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. But that was an ancient story about chivalry. This is a modern story. People's emotions, people's insecurities, people's distress, people's hopes and dreams. Here was a fairy story that everybody wanted to work. I knew that something profound was coming my way and I was just um, treading water, waiting for it. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know where it was. I didn't know if it was coming next year or, or next month. But I knew I was different from what I was, and where I was going. It is the spring of 1981. Mrs. Thatcher has been Prime Minister for nearly two years. In London, Brixton is in flames. And after Brixton, Handsworth, Bristol, Moss Side, Toxteth. There are more people out of work than at any time since the 1930s. In 1981, 
this is what the nation's story had come to. Perhaps, as the princess said, most people were ready for a fairy tale. The state coach, surely the most beautiful vehicle in all the world. A free translation into carved and gilded imagery of all the history and tradition of Britain and the Empire. Like all golden coaches, like Cinderella's, this one was built to astonish and bewitch. Only this is a coach for real kings and queens, whose ancestors reach back a thousand years to the beginnings of the nation. 1948, a royal christening. A future queen and a boy born to be king, Charles Philip Arthur George. 1953, a coronation. In the four corners of the earth, her subjects acclaim. Elizabeth is queen. The stage is set. There is a queen, Elizabeth. There is a prince, Charles. Among the page boys, there is Andrew Parker Bowles, who will also have a part to play. Only the princess is missing. Diana will not be born for another eight years. I was a rebel. I always did the dance. I always did um, the opposite for everybody else. I wasn't academically interested at all. I just wanted to be with people and have fun and, you know, look, look on after people, <laughs> things like that. I got the prize of being the kindest girl in school. I got the prize of this. This doesn't ring rebel. I know, so but it was underlying. It was always there. Well, the rebel was going on underneath, but but I didn't come out. What do you mean? They didn't see it? Or? They didn't see it. 1969. Diana is eight. Prince Charles is nearly 21. And at Carnarvon Castle, he's about to be invested as Prince of Wales. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. It was the first Queen Elizabeth who said that a crown was more pleasant to look at than to wear. She knew there was a price to pay for being a queen or a king. It's a very demanding role, being Prince of Wales. But it's an equally more demanding role, being King. Who knows what fate will produce? Who knows what circumstances will provoke? Any thoughts about the lady that a Prince of Wales should marry? Um, <laughs> yes. Well, I suppose, um, you see, it's really difficult because you've got to remember that when you marry, in my position, you're going to marry somebody who perhaps one day is going to become queen. And you've got to choose somebody very carefully, I think. And it's got to be somebody pretty special, because if you choose somebody who isn't used to it, it can, I think, probably cause the most awful tension. Kensington Gardens. Kensington Palace. An old admirer returns to pick up the pieces. James Colthurst. Etonian, doctor, minor aristocrat, old friend of Diana. He'd known her since before the story began. She must have been just about 17. 
Yeah, she's pretty young. Well, she was great fun. Real breath of joy. Well, she had a flat in, uh, in uh, just on the old Brompton Road. It was Earl's Court, it was Earl Brompton Road. Loved it, so happy then. All girls of whom she was the declared chief chick. And I had three girls living with me. They had the best time of my life. And when fate came calling for Diana, James was in the front row watching it happen. Diana invited me around to dinner. And uh, as I arrived, she said, a uh, little bit sort of excitable, she said, I'm afraid I can't be here for dinner. I heard a good, strong engine of a car outside. The flatmates, uh, they mentioned, you know, it's Prince Charles. And at that stage, I think the die was cast, as it were. Mm. Can, is there any possibility of any announcement of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Can you tell me uh, if there's any possibility? I'm not going to say anything. Okay. Okay. Prince Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. Careful. <laughs> that when the thing really started to get serious, when I was, uh, I was being 18 and a half, I was asked to stay with some friends in Sussex, and they said, oh, the Prince of Wales is staying at Axis playing polo. So I thought, wow, I haven't seen him for ages. He's just broken up with his girlfriend, that bat has just been killed. And I said, it would be nice to see him. I was so unimpressed. Anyway, I sat there and his man walked in, and I thought, well, I am quite impressed this time round. I was different and everything else. He chatted me up. I you know, I was like a bad rash. She was all over me. I thought, you know, oh. Mm. And we were sitting on this bed and straw barbecue that night, and we were talking about Batten and his girlfriend. And I said, You must be so lonely. And I said, It's pathetic watching you walking up the aisle and support um, with all that that's coffee in front. I said, You know, ghastly. It means someone beside you. Oh, <laughs> wrong word. Whereupon he leapt upon me, so mm. kissing me and everything. I thought, well, yeah, yeah, you know, this is not what people do. And he was all over me for the rest of the evening, following me around, everything, puppy. And, um, yeah, I was flattered, but I was very puzzled. Next day, he said, oh, he was coming to Buckingham Palace, and I've got some work to do, but you wouldn't mind sitting there while I do my work. And I thought, well, bugger it, I do mind sitting there while you do your work. And I said that. Mm. And uh, that sort of lit up something in him, because someone wants it back. So it was quite a challenge. And then it started to gather. So were you being wooed? Seriously. At not. a rate. But he wasn't consistent with his courting abilities. He'd ring me out every day for a week and then he would speak to me for three weeks. Very old. And I accepted that. I thought, fine, well, he knows where I am, he wants me. And the thrill when he used to ring up was so immense, intense, drive the other three girls in my flat crazy. But, um, you know, it was all, it was all. I, I think she, she had a dream, and uh, she hoped the dream would come to life. An older man uh, who was in a prominent position, like me, wanted to have me around. I think she had ideas of what she'd like it to be. And uh, I think there were other, other elements that it would have been difficult to foresee even had she been older. At the age of 19, although I was daunted at the prospect at the time, I felt I had the support of my husband-to-be. I wanted to share everything together. Balmoral Castle, in the north of Scotland. Favourite retreat of the royal family. Now Diana was invited as a guest. It's like being sucked in. Yeah, there's people pushing, mm -hmm. people pulling, all in the same direction. But often, as Diana grew closer to the royal circle, she found that someone else was already there. 
Camilla Parker Bowles. Camilla went to the races. She was at the polo matches. Sometimes, even at Balmoral, Camilla was also a guest. This is where Charles caught a Diana. And this is where Camilla took a look at her. The band of the Extreme Guards played and the spectators glued themselves to the railings outside Buckingham Palace, all for a glimpse of any engagement day activity. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well what a marvellous day for you today. Lovely day, lovely day. We're all very happy. I saw Diana last night. She's looking absolutely radiant. Radiant and very happy. I've never seen her look better. Just delighted and, and happy. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> yes. Well, it obviously means, your own interpretation. obviously means two very happy people. Yes. Well, Once again, congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. Very kind. And the most extraordinary thing is we had this ghastly interview uh, the day we announced our engagement, and this ridiculous ITN man said, Are you in love? So I thought, What a thick question. So I said, Yes, of course we are, in the sort of fat, slow range that I was. And Charles turned around and said, what in ever in love means? And that threw me completely. I thought, what a strange question. What strange answer. Answer. God. How does it traumatise me? Morning, officer, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Parker Bowles is just starting his inspection. Andrew Parker Bowles, of course, is an old friend of Prince Charles. They used to play polo together. He and his wife Camilla often entertained Prince Charles at their home in Gloucestershire. It has been rumoured that Prince Charles proposed to Lady Diana there. At seven in the morning. Barbara Daly, makeup artist, arrives at Clarence House, where Diana is getting ready for the wedding. I liked her immediately. She was looking at television. It's kind of a very strange thing, because you could see the crowds on the small television that was just under the window. And there were all the crowds that we could see on the television, right outside the window. And she said, this is a lot of fuss for one girl getting married. We met 13 times when we were married. <laughs> we walked down to the carriage and she just sort of gave my hand a little squeeze and then hummed me a little ditty, which was from a commercial, One Cornetto. I don't know, do you remember that little commercial? It was about an ice cream, and it had a big glitzy carriage in it. And, uh, and, and then off she went, <laughs> off she went. Just one cornetto, give it to me, delicious ice cream, oh, me, Paris. Beautiful girl, the handsome prince, the sunshine, the crowds, a fairy tale. It was magical. I desperately wanted to work. 
I desperately loved my husband. I wanted to share everything together. Charles Philip Arthur George, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her? I will. Diana, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband? I will. is the stuff of which fairy tales are made. The prince and princess on their wedding day. The marriage has both a private face and a public importance. It must be especially true of this marriage in which are placed so many hopes. And stand for the truth that we help to shape this world and are not just its victims. The escort, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Parker Bowles, Charles and Lady Diana stayed with him and his wife Camilla in Wiltshire on two occasions at the end of the year. So they're among friends as they ride along the map. The honeymoon is over. Diana is no longer on the outside looking in. Now, she's on the inside, looking out. In a space of a year, my whole life had changed, turned upside down. It was isolating. You had to either sink or swim. And you had to learn that very fast. I'd sort myself out. If I tripped up, which invariably I did, because I was new at the game, a ton of bricks came down on me. Now lots of tears.
It was a few months after the wedding. Diana was 20 years old. In the autumn of 1981, she came here to the English National Ballet to take lessons from the dance instructor, Anne Allen. Lovely, and release. Lovely, darlings. Great, that's beautiful. All oh, right, something completely different. Feet parallel. Yes? Bending one, stretching two. Relax out before we start. Deep breath. So, I was a private dancing teacher. That's it. There you go. When I first met her, you could see that there was a huge shyness. But over time, as we went through our dance class, realized just how much dance meant to her. She has danced in her soul. I realize the pure enjoyment that it gave her. She loved the freeness of being able to move and dance. She loved it. She loved it. I could see it helped to alleviate her emotional life. That was hard for her at that time. Maybe I was the first person ever to be in this family who ever had a depression or was ever openly tearful. in the sense that, you know, when you've got engaged with someone, you love them. She loved Charles, yes. But Charles loved another woman. It's very hard when, for any woman, when you love someone and you realize that perhaps they don't love you or I think it made her very sad, devastated. She felt she wasn't enough. BBC News at six o'clock. The Falkland Islands, the British colony in the South Atlantic, has fallen. That's what Argentina is saying. For the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. That a large task force will sail as soon as all preparations are complete. I couldn't understand the level of interest. As far as I was concerned, I was a fat, chubby, 20-year-old. My husband and I had to keep everything together, and yet there was a lot of anxiety going on within four walls. I used to get in the car with Charles, and I used to blow up in the car. There'd be crowds everywhere. He said, no, what's the matter? I said, I can't be out of this car. He said, well, I said, I got this phone, but I can't get this car. I don't feel safe, you know. And I was neurotic always. But then when I got out of the car, Buckingham Palace have just announced that the Princess of Wales is expecting a baby. The Princess is said to be in excellent health. The Queen and members of both families are said to be delighted. I don't know to say how many planes joined the race, but I counted them all out, and I counted them all back. The baby will be second in line to the throne. She told me that she was pregnant. 
and she wanted to give her marriage absolutely everything that she could. She really wanted to, everybody to feel proud, but particularly Charles. It was very important because, of course, he was going to be the future king. We, the British people, are proud of what has been done. Proud of these heroic pages in our island story. Proud to be British. I felt the whole country was in labor with me. Everybody was thrilled to bits. It'd been quite a difficult pregnancy. I hadn't been very well throughout it. So by the time William arrived, it was a great relief because it was all peaceful again. And I was well for a time. You have to understand how hard that was to hear. We're talking 1982-3. When she realized that Charles is seeing Camilla, and I just remember being quite horrified about what she was saying me, and at the same time, rather shocked. She was worried about what it was that was going on. I know that she did ask Camilla to leave her husband alone. I thought that was quite brave of her, actually, because I know how much that must have taken for her to do that. And what do you do about it? What can you do about it? All you can do is to try to make the marriage work and hope in time that's, that things change, but that's not really what happened. I don't think the concerns about Camilla ever stopped. She was aware things had been going on. The staff all knew. Everybody knew. Everybody knew where he was going. So she didn't know who to trust. I noticed that she had lost a little bit of weight. And that's when she told me that she was bulimic. It was pure pressure stress. You could see her fading physically. It was clear to all those who knew her that the bulimia was a reaction to her, the circumstances she found herself in. Everybody knew about the bulimia in the family, um, and they all blamed the failure of the match on the bulimia. And that's taken some time to get them to think differently. I said I was rejected, but I didn't think I was good enough for this family, so I took it out on myself. I said I could have gone to alcohol, which would have been obvious. Could have been anorexic, which would be need more of it. I decided to do a more discreet thing, which ultimately wasn't discreet, but um, I chose to hurt myself instead of hurting all of you. I felt compelled to perform, compelled to go out and do my engagements and not let people down. And in a way, by being out in public, they supported me. Although they weren't aware just how much healing they were giving me, and it carried me through. We'd be going round, and all you could hear was, oh, she's on the other side. Now, if you're a man, like my husband, proud man, you mind about that if you hear it every day for four weeks. You look as if you've got tears in your eyes. Why? I've been waiting for so long to see you. Oh. Oh. <laughs> With the media attention came a lot of jealousy. 
I've come to the conclusion that really it would have been far easier to have had two wives. <laughs> to have covered both sides of the street. And I could have down the middle directing the operation. <laughs> We were a very good team in public, albeit what was going on in private. Rampant bulimia, feeling of being no good at anything and failed in every direction. A husband who loved someone else. I knew it. You just know. in this environment mm. and um, he was, it was all found out and he was chucked out and then he was killed and that was the biggest blow of my life I must say which I, I don't find easy to discuss 1985 Diana was now the mother of two young princes and he was a royal protection officer Barry Manneke I mean, I was quite happy to give all this up, well, I have all this. At the moment, at the time, it was quite something to have all this, um, just to go off and live with it. I couldn't believe it. Well, one can. It's and he not... kept saying he thought it was a good idea too. So. Oh, God. Right. Yeah. But you needed some adventure. Okay. Okay. I just needed to tell and someone what? to tell me that I was all right. And he kicked me out in the sense of mentally kick me outside and make me go into my engagements, because I used to sort of scream in this room. Charles thought he knew, but I never, never, never had any proof. Mm -hmm. I should never have played with fire, and I did, and I got very burned. Well, when you say play with fire, you have it, you, I mean, you have you, the same thing that they have in section. No. So you have an, an intimacy, yeah. which you were getting. Yeah. Um, I would say yes. Thomas. Fortune. Did you feel like we were that? Yeah, I suppose you said it, yes. I'm sure I did. I was like a little girl in front of the house. Desperate for praise. Desperate. And it got so difficult for people, so jealous, bitchy in this house. And eventually he had to go. And three weeks after he left, he was killed in the motion by accident. And, and he was the greatest friend I've ever had. And that was a real killer. There were two unhappy people in the marriage. In a letter a year later, Charles told a friend, I'm in a kind of cage, pacing up and down and longing to be free. How awful incompatibility is, and how dreadfully destructive it can be for the players in this extraordinary drama. It has all the ingredients of a Greek tragedy. Friends on my husband's side were indicating that I was unstable, sick, and should be put in a home of some sort in order to get better. There's no better way to dismantle a personality than to isolate it. I'm 
mysterious brain disease has spread to more than 50 herds in 14 counties. BSE, as the disease is known, kills them. Scientists don't know what's causing it or where it came from, but they are worried. It is the mid-80s. A kind of darkness has fallen on the green and pleasant land. There is division in the ruling house of Windsor. The countryside is infected by BSE. And in the cities, there is a new, more sinister illness. My view of Lord Family before I went to work for them, like most people of my age, I'd go into the moniker scan. You know, it was a pretty good institution, good for Great Britain. Then suddenly you jump inside this box of royal magic. And you find out how these tricks work. And the kudos of who these people are wears off pretty damn quick. In 1986, Ken Wharf joined the staff of the Prince of Wales. He would soon succeed Barry Manicky as Princess Diana's Royal Protection Officer. Diana said, what do you want to drink? It was almost like being at a wine bar in Kensington with a friend. Immediately she said, do you know about Camilla Parker Bowles? Well, I couldn't deny that I, I knew about it because I'd been informed about it. And I said, yes, of course. And um, there was a hesitation there. And she said, well, she features um, most days, most hours and minutes of my life. Um, I didn't really understand at that point exactly what she meant. But of course, the days that followed, the weeks that followed, the months that followed, I knew exactly what she meant by that. She sort of carried out her own research and found that previous Prince of Wales's had their own mistresses. I was just saying to my husband, you know, why, why this lady around? And he said, well, I refused to be the Prince of Wales and never had a mistress. But this was the 20th century, moving into the 21st century, and she wasn't prepared to accept that. And she might prefer that Camilla Parker Wilson just disappear. There was a genuine unhappiness here. My father-in-law said to my husband, uh, if your marriage doesn't work out, you can always get back to her after five years, which is exactly it. I mean, for real, I knew that it happened after five years. I knew something was happening before that, but the fifth year, I had uh, confirmation. So I went to the top lady and I was sobbing, and I said, what do I do? I'm coming to you, what do I do? And she said, I don't know what you should do. And that was it. That was help. People were saying that she's mad. You know, 20 years on, they're still telling her that she's mad. But the fact of it is that here was a case of a woman trying to come to terms with the fact that her husband was in a relationship and having an affair with another woman. It is as simple as that. It is that simple. For the first time, doctors from all over Britain have met to discuss AIDS, the disease that's already claimed over 600 lives in the United States. Junior Health Minister Edwina Curry said good Christian people who didn't misbehave wouldn't catch the disease. And she advised businessmen who... Then I found myself being more and more involved with people who were rejected by society. I found an affinity there. I respected very much the honesty I found on that level with people I met. When I used to sit on hospital beds and hold people's hands, when I saw the reassurance that gave, I did it everywhere.
What she really liked was to sit on the bed. Very informal. These were all people who were probably going to die. Patrick Jeffson was Diana's private secretary. Cambridge, the Royal Navy. Often on his ancestors had served the royal family for hundreds of years. He was a monarchist, eager to please, perfectly cut out for the royal court. Just knowing that she was needed, that what she was doing was worthwhile, gave her a great sense of fulfillment, I think. Because a lot of the time she felt excluded, real or imagined, from the royal mainstream and from the kind of happy family life that she had wanted for herself. When people are dying, they're much more open, more vulnerable, much more real than other people. And I appreciated that. And I love being with people. So after a day of working in wards like this, we take her back to the palace, where I knew there was nobody waiting to welcome her or say, how did it go? Or, well done. So increasingly, this sort of work became more and more important to her. It was the summer of 1986. With one fairy tale marriage falling apart, another one was about to begin. It had all the necessary ingredients. Young prince, a carriage, a bride, a dress. A familiar voice from the BBC this wonderful day here in London, all the marvellous pageantry and ceremonial. Once again, the Royal Show was well and truly on the road, but very few of those present understood what was happening before their eyes. I'm joined now by Captain James Hewitt. He's the right-hand man to the Brigadier who's organised this entire procession. And I think your very presence here this very morning means that you're confident, you're relaxed, that everything is going to plan behind the scenes. Is that right? Well, I hope so. Last time I left the scene, everything was running quite smoothly. The same crowds, the same wave on the balcony, the same kiss. It's hard now not to think that when Sarah Ferguson married her prince, the House of Windsor was not tempting fate. No one knew then what we know now. Charles was with Camilla. Now Diana was involved with the captain of the guard. For the Royal House of Windsor, the Royal Family, this was not the direction the Golden Coaches were supposed to be headed. Going to work for the prince and the princess in the late 1980s meant becoming part of an organization that had as its number one priority keeping quiet about the fact that this was a marriage in name only. There's virtually no sexual relation with you and the child. Sort of once every three weeks. And then it fizzled out about seven years ago, six years ago. The number one priority was to maintain what turned out to be a lie. She was saying, why aren't you with us? Why don't you want to be with us? Clearly there was something amiss. She actually loved her husband. And I think even despite Camilla, she was prepared to play this double act. 
being dishonest with her husband. But the trouble was being asked to maintain that facade distanced us from the true principles of decent behavior, of monarchy, the cover-up had to be damaging for the crown itself. Camilla's sister's birthday. I could hear Diana shouting my name. I said, Ken, I, I can't find my husband and I can't see Camilla either. Anyway, it was a nursery, I remember. And there was Charles Camilla sat on this small sofa, talking. And I don't know where Diana just managed to conjure up this confidence, but literally walked across and just calmly said to Camilla, and the Prince of Wales was completely shocked by this, although thinking about it, must have expected that she would have noticed that they weren't in this room. And she said, look, I know what's going on, you know, I understand that. So don't, you know, sort of treat me like an idiot. And Camilla said something really unusual and said, well, it's all right for you, Diana. You, you've got two wonderful boys. Now, <laughs> you can make them that what you like. I, I, I've never understood it. But suddenly this was an awakening because Diana knew at this point there was no hope or any chance of a reconciliation. So this had taken nearly eight, nine years to reach this point. But in her eyes, it proved that this meeting, this, this liaison, was never going to break up and was never going to bring out a satisfactory relationship in her eyes. This was the beginning again. And so Diana cut her own path. Gone now was the chubby Sloan Ranger. This was a new Diana. The people's princess in the making. Independent. Modern. Even flirtatious. Not everyone was pleased. There was a great deal of jealousy from the grey men who sat behind Prince Charles, not wanting him to be living in her shadow. Her character was being written down, as she saw it, as a campaign to sideline her and remove her from the boys. That was her worry, was that she was going to lose the boys. Overriding above everything else, that was the concern. And that they were using a character rundown as a means of enabling that to happen, or even making it the, the absolutely logical and understandable next step. And she told you this? Oh, yes. November. Windsor Castle is engulfed in flames. To some, it seemed like a kind of divine judgment. The home of the Windsor dynasty, its most potent symbol, like so much else about the monarchy, was crumbling into dust. Nineteen ninety two was the fortieth anniversary of the Queen's accession to the throne. It had not been a happy year. And in a speech she gave to the Guildhall in the City of London, there was a note in her voice that we'd never heard before. Nineteen 
1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. In the aftermath of Friday's tragic fire at Windsor, it is especially so. They're the pictures they didn't want you to see. Looking at today's pages 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 12, 13, 20 and 21, it's easy to see why. I, like Queen Victoria, have always been a believer in that old maxim, moderation in all things. And the pictures show them in a clearly affectionate mood. It is possible to have too much of a good thing. There have been rumours, there have been denials. Now I'll tell you what I know. The book, due to go on sale tomorrow, claims she made several attempts on her life. We do face a crisis in the House of Windsor. It's obvious to everyone. I sometimes wonder how future generations will judge the events of this tumultuous year. There is chronic instability inside the royal family. Their body language suggesting a marriage in deep trouble. She does one thing on her own, he does another, and they just don't meet physically, mentally, or emotionally. How much longer can this tragedy go on, howled the Daily Mirror this morning. then really, the only thing you can do is the beast must go for slaughter. December, 1992. Two weeks after the Queen's speech, it was officially announced that Diana and Prince Charles had decided to separate. La France va-t-elle redonner le sourire à Lady Diana La princesse qui a débarqué tout à l'heure à Paris était radieuse, rayonnante. Derrière le sourire obligé, destiné au paparazzi, se cache une nouvelle princesse. Diana, la princesse trahie par l'institution monarchique outre-manche, déterminée à donner un sens à son existence de princesse. I remember at the time, there was a mixture of relief because we no longer had to pretend and we no longer had to maintain that fiction. But at the same time, we were always conscious that there was a big, silent, rather threatening presence that told us, certainly told me, that the princess wasn't really wanted anymore. Everything changed after we separated. Life became very difficult then for me. People's agendas changed overnight. I was a problem, I was a liability. How are we going to deal with her? It became a condition of your patriotism that you must therefore support the Prince of Wales. The belief that if we were loyal monarchists, we had to be on his side. Well, I'm sorry. As a loyal monarchist, my loyalty was to the principles of, of the British crown. And I saw royal virtues embodied in her more than in him. But I think the real damage was done by those who tried to marginalize or in more recent years, airbrushed Diana out of royal history. They saw that their man's path to the crown would be a great deal easier if he were not competing for popularity 
with his ex-wife. Every strong woman in history has had to walk down a similar path. It's the strength that causes the fear. Why is she strong? Where did she get it from? Where is she taking it? Where is she going to use it? I'll fight till the end. Nineteen ninety three. The lines of battle have become clearer. There is a Charles camp, there is a Diana camp. Behind Charles, all the ancient power of the royal court. But for Diana, power lay in the court of public opinion. And to strengthen her advantage, she was taking lessons with a speech coach. Can I watch you? Oh. If you come in here, you sit down and be quiet. You've got to be very quiet. Very quiet. Don't touch it, William, because it's all focused on me. <clears throat> okay, let's do it. Let's pretend, right? Okay, so you, Your Royal Highness, um, you're currently concentrating very much on your charity work. Would you like to tell us why you feel it's so important to you? I got nothing else to do. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, sorry. Take two. No, this records a lot. <laughs> go back, go back, go back to the top now, because this is what Bobby doing. Number one, she had been abandoned by her family, having become a huge embarrassment and disgrace. Each person is born with individual qualities and potential. Slightly faster now. Let's move on, yes. Only slightly. <laughs> Get a little angry now with that. I can't be angry and speak like yes, that. Yes, you can. I can't get my words out. I'm so tired. When am I going to see you when you're not tired? The mornings, ladies and gentlemen. More energy. Stop. There's a lovely chunk in there. You were pushing the thing out, and it started to come from you. That's that's what connects you mm. and see who we're who we're after. So I'm not manufacturing you, I'm just bringing out <laughs> that bit of you that wants a voice, which is the 30-year-old woman, 31-year-old woman, who has something important to say. You've got a voice that will want to hear. And you're telling a story. You're a storyteller. And the quality you have, which they haven't got, is that you talk to them from the guts. You know, person of the people. They're scared of that. So let's not lose it. Let's keep it as well. Diana had no intention of losing that special quality that her husband's camp was scared of. The British people need someone in public life to give affection. I can give love for half an hour, for a day. For a month, but I can give. I know I can. Freedom is so vivid, stunningly beautiful. I just remember her walking in in a striking orange outfit. This beautiful lady. I just remember feeling that day that I could have achieved anything. But I know that that day changed my life. This was where we were, wasn't it? When we were waiting for her. We were in that room over there. Yeah. We went in with her. And then she came round that corner. And we weren't least expecting it. She was just so warm and it was like just having a chat with a friend. She related myself and my sister to William and Harry, which was quite surreal. 
was if you'd known her for a long time. Press were not allowed into the room where Gemma met Diana. Only one photograph exists, a paralysed 11-year-old from Liverpool and a princess who had now become the most famous woman in the world. She was the most genuine person I've ever met. She just oozed her. You could tell straight away that she was genuinely interested. She genuinely cared. Even now, I still can look back on that meeting and it helps me get through. I don't think there's another human being who could have such impact in such a short space of time. She understood personal struggle and she'd been through her own trials and tests in life. And I think she could relate to people going through their own personal battles. The establishment that I'm married into, they see me as a, a threat of some kind. Because I lead from the heart, not the head. Because I do things differently, because I don't go by a rule book. For Charles, the threat was real. People were beginning to ask whether he'd become king after all. In 1994, in a documentary with Jonathan Imbleby, he decided to go on the offensive. The most damaging charge that is made in relation to your marriage is that you were, because of your relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles, from the beginning, persistently unfaithful to your wife and thus caused the breakdown. What is your, your response to that persistent uh, criticism? Oh, that's the persistent criticism, is it? <laughs> the, the, um, um, Mrs. Parker Bowles is a great friend of mine. I have a large number of friends. I'm terribly lucky to have so many friends. She has been a friend for a very long time and will continue to be a friend for a very long time. That's what friends are for. Were you faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down, us both having tried. Diana saw Charles's interview and the book that followed as hurtful and damaging. She was on the receiving end of a whispering campaign in which everything from her competence as a princess uh, to her suitability as a mother and her, uh, indeed, her very sanity were being questioned. She was faced with a choice of either meekly turning a deaf ear to what was being said about her to falling in with the plans of people who wanted to see her excluded, marginalized, or doing something about it. Whenever she felt threatened, Diana had always followed the same idea. She believed that if only people could hear her real story, she would always have their support. In 1992, she had sent for her old friend James Culthurst, who secretly smuggled out the recorded interviews used by Andrew Morton for his book, Diana, The True Story. She was in a corner and she felt it and she wanted to explode. Yes, it was explicit about the, the state of the relationship, but it wasn't nearly as fierce as we know it could have been. Later, there were long nights, also in secret, improving her storytelling skills with her speech coach, Peter Settler. Yeah, it is. <sighs> I don't understand. 
Yes, sir. Good job, man. This is having a bad day. 1795. Diana felt her back against the wall once more. And on the 5th of November, bonfire night, she prepared to tell a story again. This time to BBC's Panorama. Do you really believe that a campaign was being waged against you? Yes, I did. Absolutely. Yeah. Why? I was a separated wife of the Prince of Wales. I was a problem. Full stop. Never happened before. What to do with her? Can't we pack her off to somewhere quietly rather than campaign against mm. her? She won't go quietly. That's the problem. I'll fight till the end because I believe that I have a role to fulfil and I've got two children to bring up. Listen to yourself. It was not only what Diana said on Panorama that surprised people, but the way she said it. That was the real revelation. Right. She chose to fight back in some pretty unconventional ways. She actually was an extraordinarily strong person. We must recognize that the people who criticized her always underestimated her. And not least, they underestimated her anger. She was a proud aristocratic woman who had been very badly treated. Do you think You'll ever be queen? No, I don't. No. Why do you think that? I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts, in people's hearts. But I don't see myself being queen of this country. The story of the prince and his princess was coming to an end. 22 million viewers of Panorama watched it happening before their eyes. There was a sense of no going back, a sense of bridges being burned. Do you think the Prince of Wales will ever be king? I don't think any of us know the answer to that. And obviously it's a question that's in everybody's head. But who knows? Who knows what fate will produce? Who knows what circumstances will provoke? Summer 1997. The prince and his princess are divorced. Diana will no longer be the future Queen of England. On the third, she arrived at the Albert Hall for the English National Ballet's performance of Swan Lake. She would always tell people who asked her that if she hadn't been a princess, she would have liked to have been a dancer. Now, she had come to the ballet for the last time.
This is BBC Radio in London. According to the French news agency, a French government minister has said within the past few minutes that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died. He said she was killed in a car crash in Trumpers. I'll repeat that. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car crash in the centre of Paris. I remember coming on breaking news and it it was just too much to even absorb. The idea of what had happened. I couldn't stop thinking that if only I had still been protecting her, something like this would never have happened. Her last few months didn't give me the impression that she knew where she was going or how she was going to get there or who she was going to go with. The crash came through on the news in Paris and strangely enough I expected her to call of course, when she had a crisis, that's when she'd sometimes call. Of course, she, she wasn't going to call. It was an odd feeling. The sense of the fate. Diana sadly dies in a tragic road accident in Paris. And then what happens? The Prince of Wales did marry Camilla Parker Bowles. If only Diana could have been around, she would have said to me, you see, Ken, I wasn't wrong, was I? It just felt like such an honor to be invited to the funeral. To lose a person like that, it just makes it even more precious, the time we had. A lot of the things that I admired about the monarchy, for me, died with the Princess of Wales. And more than that, with the way in which she was treated before she died. That idea of the monarchy has died for me. The idea that respect should be given unthinkingly or out of blind loyalty has gone. People's emotions, people's hopes and dreams, the fairy story had come to an end. Thursday night at 9 o'clock on Channel 4, a revelatory documentary about Diana and her stepmother, Rain Spencer. It's the story of two formidable women and their extraordinary lives through marriage, divorce and tragedy.
Next tonight on 4-7, decoding historical evidence buried deep under London. The mystery of the Crossrail Skulls.